So just starting with a definition first. Um, so aryl and, and vinyl halides, right? These are um, compounds where there's some degree of unsaturation in the of um, an aryl halide. There's gonna be some sort of aromatic ring, like a benzene ring attached to a halogen, either bromine, chlorine, um, iodine, or fluorine. Um, but the really important part to remember is that this carbon already has a pi system, um, or it's sp2 in hybridization. Um, so a vinyl halide is not an aromatic ring, but instead is some sort of alkene, and that will have a corresponding halogen attached, also sp2 hybridized at the carbon atom. Um, so these sp2 carbons already have a pi system that they're participating in, and they have an unhybridized p orbital. And it's the presence of that unhybridized p orbital that's going to limit their reactivity. So we'll talk first about how uh, these compounds are inert towards SN1 and SN2, or they do not react via typical SN1 and SN2 mechanisms. So overall, if you have some sp2 carbon bound to a leaving group and you treat it with a nucleophile, no matter if that nucleophile is good or poor, no matter if it's a strong base or a weak base either, um, and independent of the solvent, you get no reaction. Um, the reason they don't react is because these uh, aryl and vinyl halides go through unstable, very unstable transition states. Or the transition states are quite high energy. So let's do a little bit explanation of, of that transition state. Um, in this first example here, we have a vinyl bromide that's primary and, of course, does have a good leaving group. And we're treating this with potassium methylate, which is an ionic compound. It's negatively charged at sulfur. And ionic sulfur with three lone pairs is a great nucleophile. We learned that in Orgo 1. It's also in the with dimethylformamide or polar aprotic solvent. So this was sort of the recipe for SN2. So if it did undergo SN2, the mechanism would be something like this where the nucleophilic sulfur is going to attack that carbon that's bearing the leaving group and the leaving group would be eliminated. I'm using um, dotted lines here to show this mechanism occur. Um, if it did occur, it would have to go through this transition state where the purple carbon atom is both losing the leaving group, bromide dissociates, and sulfur attacks from the back side. All right, that's the SN2 trajectory. Um, and then you also have a hydrogen atom on this carbon. That hydrogen would sort of linearize with the rest of this organic molecule. Um, so originally 
the carbon is sp2 hybridized and therefore it's trigonal planar what's happening here is we now have two transient bonds that are forming and breaking as that occurs the sulfur is partially negative it's donating one of its three lone pairs and the bromide is gaining a lone pair as it leaves it's partially negative as well and there are only two permanent bonds that are not forming and breaking on that central carbon. So the central carbon is sort of SP-like. It's not exactly SP because this is a hypothetical transition state and not an isolable molecule. Um, but SP-like atoms have linear geometry. So that's why I've drawn the alkene in a straight line with the hydrogen. Um, and sp atoms have p orbitals. So one p orbital set is coming in and out of the page. And that p orbital set is already um, occupied with pi electrons in the form of a pi bond. So you can think of that as like being the pz axis. The other p orbital that's sort of developing on the central carbon is one along the y-axis. Um, so what you have here are two parallel, or excuse me, two perpendicular p orbitals, which means that the geometry is linear, or it's a very constrained geometry. Another way of verbalizing that is just that it has a very low Um, so it's a very high energy transition state. And therefore it gives no reaction. It's just too slow of a process. So another example would be for an aryl halide. Um, this one is also sp2 hybridized at carbon. It's secondary um, and has a good leaving group, chloride. Um, we're treating that aryl halide with a different nucleophile this time. The nucleophile is sodium cyanide, another ionic compound, where cyanide is a great nucleophile. And it generally loves to attack and displace a leaving group through SN2. Once again, DMSO is a polar aprotic solvent. So this looks like a recipe for SN2. Um, if cyanide were to attack, it would have to do so like this, where it attacks from the back face, anti to the leaving group, and kicks out the chloride. And once again, let me just draw that with dotted lines. It doesn't really occur. It's too slow. Um, so this would go through some transition state, which is unstable. We're not even gonna worry about drawing it. It's the same argument as the one above. And then it would lead to some hypothetical product. Keep in mind that SN2 occurs with stereochemical inversion. So uh, the product would look something like this, where now, the cyanide would have to be not outside of the airing where the chlorine was, but have to be inside. And then we complete the six membered ring from there. And the pi system would remain intact. Um, and then this fused uh, furan, furan is still in place. Okay. And that's really not even the best way to draw that. Um, so you get a very unstable product because now the cyano is within the aromatic pi system. In other words, 
this because the nucleophile cyanide is repelled by the electron-rich pi system. And stereochemical inversion is basically impossible. This product is only theoretical and too unstable. So that's an additional reason for these arrow ones as to why they don't undergo SN2, um, because the nucleophile would have to go through the center of the ring to displace the leaving group. So stereochemical inversion is not feasible. Okay, um, so one other example of a reaction that doesn't work is an SN1, where this time we're still starting with the aryl halide. And that's sp2 hybridized at carbon. It's secondary and has a bromide leaving group. Um, but now we're doing solvolysis where the only thing on the agent arrow is water. And that means that water is both the nucleophile and the solvent. Just keep in mind that water is a very stable compound. It's not charged, it only has two lone pairs. So it's a poor nucleophile. Um, and poor nucleophiles do SN1 chemistry, where in SN1, the rate limiting step is this departure of the leaving group. Once again, let's show that that does not really occur. So it's going to uh, form a very unstable cation if it did occur. I'm gonna draw the cation first as if it's planar, and then I'll draw um, an orbital diagram for that. So the pi system remains intact. And now we just have a positive charge. This is an aryl cation. And it's extremely high energy. Okay. So this carbon is still in a trigonal planar type geometry, even though it lost one of its bonding domains. It's still sp2 in planar. What I'm going to do is just draw this naphthalene ring from the side on so we can look at what orbital is empty, where part of this ring is just coming out of the page. So it's fused to another uh, naphthalene ring. Or another benzene ring. Together, they're known as naphthalene. Um, and every atom in this ring is participating in conjugation. So they all have an unhybridized p orbital. All five pi bonds are still intact. Those p orbitals sit perpendicular to the ring. And I'm just going to phase them um, in some arbitrary way. This phasing doesn't matter for your purposes. That's drawing a molecular orbital. 10 pi electrons, or you can show that each of these 10 p orbitals sort of has one electron on average. Um, so the carbocation is shown on the purple carbon, which is right here. And that carbocation doesn't have an empty p orbital like most carbocations do. Instead, the empty orbital is the hybrid orbital, where the bromine uh, previously bonding, MTSP2 orbital. And MTSP2 orbitals really don't like to be in. They're quite unstable when they're not filled. Um, in other words, this orbital has 33% S character, which means it's somewhat electronegative, especially compared to a P orbital. 
And so therefore it hates to be empty or devoid of electron density. So forming a carbocation directly on a pi system where it's not the p orbital that becomes empty, but it's the hybrid orbital is extremely slow. So all we just say that no SN1 occurs at an sp2 hybridized carbon. Okay, these typical substitution mechanisms, SN1 and SN2 only occur at carbons that start out as sp3 hybrids. Okay, um, the only somewhat stable carbocation will have the following geometry. And I'm just gonna generalize this. The carbon, <clears throat> if it's a cation, does not want to have an empty orbital that has S character, like an sp2. <clears throat> but instead it will have three sigma bonds and be sp2 hybridized with R, R prime, or double prime. Um, it is planar. These groups are sitting in the plane of your hand if your hand was perpendicular to the screen. The empty orbital for a carbocation should be the P orbital. And that empty orbital causes there to be a positive formal charge on the carbon. So it is sp2 hybridized, but it's not the sp2 orbital that's empty. It's the p orbital. P orbitals are less electronegative than orbitals, or they don't have any s character. And so they're more comfortable being empty than electron poor. The way that you get this carbocation that's sp2 is by starting with a compound that's alkyl or sp3 and when the leaving group leaves it makes this cation. That's the carbocation we always saw and did reaction mechanisms with in orgo 1. But leaving groups on sp carbons will not undergo sn1 for this reason or sn for the previous transition state reason we discussed.